I mean, it's actually, it's sort of good news that everybody's so engaged in what they're doing uh, in these three tours that were around that they're having some trouble coming back. But they will, classic GSAP style, slink into the auditorium, for example. Uh, here they come, slinking in. Um, so I just want to quickly introduce the, the panel, or more in particular, it's, I think, a fan fantastic panel. And this is a subject extremely dear to my heart, the sort of education infrastructure. I think you could also reverse the formula if you were listening to all of the speakers earlier in the day, you can also see how infrastructure is also, by definition, a form of education. Like, it actually creates the possibility of um, w one part of the community sort of talking to another part. And I'm very, very interested in the kind of transgenerational capacity of cities. And I think infrastructure also has the ability to literally have people exchange knowledge. And so in this sense, we reverse the, equ reverse the equation. What's infrastructure for generating knowledge, specifically here in the university. Anyway, just to introduce you, the um, Carol Lowenson, who's, who's the uh, uh, moderator of the panel, is an alumna of the, of the school. Firstly, an alumna of uh, Barnard College, where some of the, one of the tours is right now. Um, and, and then here at uh, GSAP with, with a Master of Architecture degree in 1979. Uh, she plays a really important role in the architectural community of New York as a partner at Mitchell uh, Jurgler Architects. I, I keep saying the same thing to Carol whenever we meet, but uh, Jurgler is by far and away the single most popular person ever to teach at this school. Uh, uh, Lois Schiller always told me this, this is something that everybody repeats, that he's just beloved beyond uh, belief. Um, and doesn't matter how far away he moved, this sense remains. So I, I, I think in a, in, a, in a way, Carol and some other alum of, of the school play such an important role in that office, which uh, uh, treasures his name and his thinking. Uh, her own practice is primarily buildings for higher education, so she's really an expert in the subject that we're talking about now. Uh, and also, of course, in general, buildings for the public sector. And of course, that whole question of the relationship between the public sector and higher education is probably one of the things we're going to talk about. Her specific expertise is really from uh, super technical buildings of the most uh, 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 advanced uh, uh, technologies, but also combined with that, the complexities of, of renovation uh, uh, and working let's say, in the gap between existing uh, fabric and new fabric, but also in the gaps between the private and the public. Again, I would say a theme of the day. It never got declared as such, but the private-public uh, issue is so, so important. Um, I think almost any of the important themes that you can think of uh, that architects are really obsessed, obsessed with, the big subjects for architects today are very, very evident in her work as, a, as, a, as an architect, as a, an incredibly thoughtful architect. So I just think it's... We're super, super lucky that she's going to moderate this panel, which is for me the most important panel. Of course, what else could matter more than the infrastructure for incubating the new minds that will, of young and old people that will, as, as it were, uh, help us with the cities of the future. So welcome again to, to Carol. Um, well, thank you, Mark. Um, and welcome, everyone. I hope you had an interesting lunch. Uh, everybody's uh, not back yet, which I think is, <laughs> do enjoy your lunch here. Um, I think it's great that the tours went on, and uh, I will look forward to hearing about it. While, while everyone was out touring, uh, we began this conversation, the, the panel. We've, we've been at it for over an hour, so if, if, this, if this feels like you're entering the middle of a conversation, I think it's because um, you are. Um, <laughs> But um, it, they're a wonderful group, and, and I'm uh, very excited to be able to have them here today. Um, we've put together this exciting panel. Um, all of the people will talk about um, what their institutions are planning, designing, and building for higher education in both New York and now around the world. Um, each one is going to give us an overview of their campus or campuses and their initiatives. Um, they're going to describe their priorities, and I think this is particularly important right now in times of um, diminishing resources, really how, how, how to establish the priorities. Um, they're also going to define their infrastructure issues. Again, this is going to be really vary among the schools. Um, for some, it's going to be a new power plant, cogen plant. For another, it's, it's the urban fabric and, and everything in between. Um, and finally, they're going to share with us their vision for the future, profiling one or several projects that they're working on. Um, one of the things that has surely changed for the better is the understanding of the connections between planning, preservation, 
architecture and urban design and real estate. And I think that's been a theme throughout the day. Um, it, it's genuine now. It's, it's true in my life and my practice. Um, it's wonderful to see that it's genuine here at the school. You know, we've talked about that it was all silos here back in the 70s and 80s. And we were, I, I was never in a planning studio or in the preservation studios. And now we're all here together from the different um, divisions um, sort of sharing ideas. So it's, it's the real thing. Um, I spoke to each of the panelists last week um, to find out w what was sort of unique or, or um, different and where the commonalities were among their uh, campuses. And I think the certain thing, themes kept coming up, although each one is, is so unique. Um, what is the university identity? Some of this is just obvious, but I think it's sort of a good way to frame it. Um, what is the university identity? What makes a campus? And that, you know, we could talk about that for a long time, but um, what is the experience of the student? Because after all, that's who these um, buildings are for. And how are consolidation, collaboration, and interdisciplinary initiatives having an impact on the physical surroundings? Um, some of these schools have really clearly identifiable campuses, but even the schools with such campuses have global initiatives that stretch the conventional images and thoughts of a university. Um, Everyone talked about standards um, and how they're changing, which is also uh, very interesting. Um, in the end, it seems that quality design, longevity, and affordable affordability are really the, the key factors. Um, before we begin, I want to share with you some basic statistics so you can understand in raw numbers the impact these institutions have on our built environment. So, you know, don't make copies of this slide. Um, I just, I, I was sort of blown away by this. You know, the, the the square footage of these four institutions uh, is over 500 million square feet in New York City. Um, we, they're educating over 500,000 students and are providing jobs for over 50,000 people. It's, this is just a, a huge, huge part of, he's taking a picture. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I just, I thought it was sort of framed things importantly for us in the context of the city. Um, so let me introduce our illustrious panelists so we can get started. Um, speaking on behalf of Columbia is Phil Petruzzullo. Um, I'm, I'm doing the condensed version, so if when you want to read the full version, it's in, it's in your books. Um, Phil is the Vice President for Manhattanville Development. He serves as the Columbia University's facilities point person on all aspects of development, design, and construction for the University's Manhattanville Initiative. He's will be the first one speaking. Um, speaking on behalf of City University of New York is Megan Moore-Wilk. Um, Megan is the Director of Space Planning at CUNY. She is responsible for tracking, evaluating, and recommending capital projects to address the space needs at each of CUNY's 23 campuses. Um, speaking on behalf of the New School is Leah Gartner. Um, Leah is Vice President for Design, Construction, and Facilities Management, where since 2004, she has overseen the growth and transformation of a collection of aging buildings into award-winning urban campus. And finally, um, speaking on behalf of NYU is um, Eve Klein, um, the Associate Vice President for Planning and Design at NYU. Um, she's responsible for design excellence, short and long-term planning, and capital project development. Um, Phil, this is your turf, so why don't you begin? Um, and at the end, we'll have a wrap up and hopefully time for some questions and answers and some lively discussion. Uh, great. Mark and Carol, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be here this afternoon uh, to join you in discussing uh, some of Columbia University's goals and objectives and planning, uh, in particular planning and design and development for the Manhattanville campus in West Harlem. But as we talk through that and I describe this to you, it's very much a story of two campuses, the Morningside campus and the Manhattanville campus, uh, and the prospects for uh, both over uh, the next century. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our project team, uh, give you an overview of 
our campus planning and our approval process, which uh, has been detailed uh, in the press over many years. Um, uh, talk about general design concepts and construction progress. Our key team members uh, in our first uh, phase of the project are Renzo Piano Building Workshop, Davis Brody Bond Adeus, and Body Lawson Associates, and also a team uh, made up of field operations for open space and other engineers and consultants working on the project. And Len Lease and McKissick and McKissick are our construction project managers. Just recently, we launched the design of uh, the sites for the Columbia Business School in Manhattanville, and the architects are Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro, and FX Bell. Uh, so uh, this is a story of uh, space constraints and campus constraints for Columbia University in the city of New York in Morningside. And I say Columbia University in the city of New York because we're an institution that is very much grounded in New York City and northern Manhattan. So unlike some of our peer institutions that have the ability or the desire to um, locate elsewhere, Columbia has uh, since the very beginning been a, a focused uh, institution focused in the city of New York. This is a slide that um, uh, many of us use, but in a very dense city like New York, uh, space per pupil is at a premium. And so uh, space constraints have put Columbia at a very notable disadvantage for many years. And people who uh, have uh, uh, been to uh, the Columbia campus and been a student here uh, know about our space constraints, and that's been the case for many years. Uh, the goals, uh, the planning goals for the university were to construct about five to 10 million square feet over the next 25 years. That was really based on studies that were done in the late 1990s showing that historical growth averaged about 200,000 square feet on average year in, year out uh, for existing programs and new, uh, new uh, initiatives of uh, the university. An objective to create modern state-of-the-art education and research facilities, very difficult to do in older buildings, especially in circumstances where those buildings are occupied and uh, we didn't have any swing space to vacate a building and modernize it and move uh, students and faculty uh, back into place. And it's virtually impossible to interrupt an ongoing uh, program. Uh, our objective was to allow for our expansion in a consolidated area and create an urban fabric, an urban campus that was integrated with the neighborhood. Uh, a uh, major goal was to promote interaction among student, faculty, and researchers in many different disciplines and find physical ways and programmatic ways of doing that. Create an open university campus with uh, additional open space, accessible open space, and finally, uh, from years of experience with interactions with the community, avoid ad hoc acquisitions of land, especially uh, where we were acquiring sites on residential blocks to build academic buildings and creating campus community issues by doing that. Uh, so this led to a set of objectives for rezoning uh, a 17-acre area uh, in West Harlem. Um, but uh, doing it in a way that respected the context of the surrounding buildings and the surrounding neighborhood. Working with the city to activate and enliven 125th Street and make connections to a wonderful new park, the West Harlem Waterfront Park, uh, which um, uh, this is now under construction. It actually opened uh, last year. and. Uh, is a, um, is a terrific amenity for West Harlem. Uh, create and enhance view corridors in, straight, in streets leading to the waterfront and create a uh, very broad market zone uh, of open space along 12th Avenue and open up views of the 
wonderful historic Riverside Drive viaduct. So those were both goals and objectives of our planning effort that came out of uh, many years of discussions with the community. This diagram shows for the campus expansion, uh, this is 125th Street, this is Broadway, this is 12th Avenue. Uh, and in the planning process, we were asked, uh, as we developed phasing plans, we were asked by the City Planning Commission to identify potential uses, and more importantly, to d d identify academic uses in the near term and think deeply about the uh, mix of those uh, uses. So President Lee Bollinger, Alan Brinkley, our provost at the time, and many other people engaged in uh, deep thinking about a first phase and what those uh, components would be. And you'll see in this slide, uh, we just numbered the, the uh, sites, but an academic conference center to bring together all disciplines in the university under uh, one roof. Uh, we don't have that today at Columbia, uh, or anything like it really. A uh, academic research building, the Jerome L. Green Science Center, uh, the foundations of which we've uh, started construction of. And uh, that is a uh, building dedicated to interdisciplinary research in the neurosciences and related fields. A new uh, academic uh, and performance building for the School of the Arts, a building for our School in International and Public Affairs, and new facilities for the Columbia Business School. And, and the importance of uh, this slide is um, to show that while this is a campus expansion plan, in many respects we are relocating, right-sizing, creating better space, and expanding existing programs at the university. And that has the multiple benefit of moving schools and programs from the Morningside campus and in part from our medical center campus and therefore allowing those older buildings to be renovated over time. So there's really a double barreled advantage here in the uh, Columbia expansion plan. And then with the city we engaged in discussions about permitted uses over time for remaining phases of the development. So you can see on future blocks we have alternate uses of academic research or uh, academic use. Another interesting thing about this slide is um, a product of uh, the need for modern space for interdisciplinary research and academics is also the need for larger floor plates. So for example, in our first phase, this building, the Jerome Green Science Center, has a floor plate of about 200 feet by 190 feet. So about 37,000 to 40,000 square foot floor plates which allow us to bring together uh, disparate but related academic disciplines under one roof and then locate them on the same floor. Uh, this is a view of the area from 133rd Street looking south taken about two years ago. This is a rendering of the campus uh, when fully built out. Some aspects of this uh, rendering are um, that the streets will remain open, uh, so we are not creating super blocks in this scheme. Uh, we are not putting up walls or gates, uh, and building heights generally track the heights of taller buildings in the surrounding area. So this is 560 Riverside, a university building. This is 3333 Broadway, a former mitchell -Lama housing complex. And this here is Manhattanville Houses, a public housing complex. And our building heights are generally um, in line with uh, the tallest buildings around us. Uh, proximity was important to our planning, so the opportunity to find space, this is pretty unique and uh, for many of our peers it's a circumstance that doesn't arise, but for us the ability to find space in close proximity to the Morningside campus uh, was a huge advantage and helped, uh, uh, 
helped us uh, promote and enhance the objective of promoting interdisciplinary research and uh, teaching and learning. Uh, this allows for us to have a, a highly transit-oriented development. So uh, mass transit is, uh, is prevalent in this area. Uh, the city has also, uh, during, the, during our planning period, built and opened the West Harlem Piers Park, and in the future we expect uh, commuter, uh, ferry service, and excursion boats to be able to use uh, the piers and also bring people to the area. Uh, sustainable design was also an important factor in uh, our planning for Manhattanville and for new construction on the Morningside campus. We've committed uh, for Manhattanville to achieve at least lead silver for all new academic and residential buildings. And we're also part of the Green Building Council's lead for neighborhood development pilot program, which allows us to take a more holistic view of a neighborhood and look at initiatives uh, that can enhance sustainability outside the uh, boundaries of a particular building. We've instituted a good neighbor program, a clean construction program. So as we grow and expand, uh, we understand that we have commitments to our neighbors and clean construction is one way in which we are trying to address the impacts of construction as we move ahead uh, in Manhattanville. Uh, from a part of the point of view of a partnership with uh, New York City, uh, the economic benefits of growth in New York are uh, demonstrable. Um, over time, we'll create 6,000 permanent university jobs, and those jobs all have benefits. Uh, they're good jobs. Uh, on average, we'll be providing 1,200 construction jobs um, per year when we ramp up construction. And when the new campus is uh, uh, ultimately built out, there'll be about a billion dollars in additional economic activity that will be generated within the city of New York. Uh, you'll hear maybe from others uh, some war stories about the uh, public approval process for Columbia. We decided to both go through a full city environmental quality review process and ULERP process and a state process for acquisition of land. Uh, this led us through scoping sessions in 2005 to final resolution of outstanding issues at the U.S. Supreme Court in December of 2010. So, uh, Planning is always complicated and uh, difficult in New York, and there are really no shortcuts uh, along the way. Uh, I mentioned some of the design concepts and uh, design principles, uh, and I'll just run through these, and then I think my time is up. So, uh, so we set maximum building heights early on. Uh, and those were in relation to uh, the higher buildings in the surrounding neighborhood. We have a mandate for transparency in building form at the lower levels of uh, the buildings. Uh, our plan allows us to have flexible research facilities, uh, large floor plates, uh, and parcel so dimensions that we can adjust over time. Uh, that also allows for a mix of academic uses, classroom buildings, administrative buildings, research, or recreation. In the zoning, there's a mandate of no gates or walls, something uh, that is very different, a departure from the, the type of expansion uh, and development we've had at um, Morningside. We put most of our uh, services below grade. We all like to talk about our central plants and our loading docks, and we put them all uh, below the street level to keep the streets open and pedestrian friendly. We're also preserving several uh, buildings in the neighborhood that have historical uh, value. And I think with that, my time is up. Is that right? Okay, my time is up. Thank you very much. I'm gonna now turn over the mic to Megan.
Good afternoon. Um, I'm really happy to be here to share with you a little bit about CUNY and some of the facilities initiatives we have ongoing. Um, before I start, I want to give a shout out to Dana Sunshine, who is my colleague at CUNY in the public-private partnerships and a graduate of the planning program. Um, CUNY is the nation's largest public urban university. We're comprised of 23 institutions with senior colleges, six community colleges with a seventh plan to open in 2012. We have an honors college, graduate center, law school, um, the new school, graduate school of journalism, the Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education, which leads to medical school for our students. We have the CUNY School of Professional Studies, which provides our online baccalaureate program. And we've recently created the CUNY School of Public Health. The 23 institutions of the university are located throughout the five boroughs of New York City. And this proximity provides CUNY with a unique ability to be a truly integrated university. Unlike most state systems, for instance, SUNY, uh, whose campuses are distributed across the state, CUNY students, faculty, and administrators have easy access to opportunities and collaborations. And from a planning point of view, this allows us to share and prioritize resources and deploy our capital resources in the most efficient and effective manner. We currently serve more than 260,000 students in degree programs and another 270,000 plus in continuing and professional education offerings. We've conferred more than a million degrees since 1967 and over half of the undergraduate students in New York City are attending one of the CUNY institutions. We also have nearly 50,000 high school students participating in College Now, which is a program that we have in conjunction with the New York City Department of Education. Um, the, in the Office of, of Facilities Planning, Construction, and Management, it's our job to make sure that the facilities resources of the university can support this half million students, plus the 35,000 individuals who make up our faculty and administration. Um, since the early days of the Free Academy, which was founded in 1847, and it's the predecessor of the City College of New York, CUNY has maintained a unique promise to New Yorkers to offer the highest quality education possible, providing opportunities for all those who strive for social, educational, and economic advancement in our society. That, promotion, er, that promise was renewed nine years ago in the aftermath of a system-wide review of CUNY and an implementation of a comprehensive program of academic and administrative reforms. In January of 2006, the Economist, the renowned international magazine, praised, CUNY, um, praised CUNY's transformation in its article, Rebuilding the American Dream Machine. This featured article said that CUNY was singular in the world of public higher education as a pathway by which immigrants and others can achieve the American dream, make that the worldwide dream of material and intellectual success. So CUNY has been on a great resurgence um, and just happening at the same time that the, uh, the economy had such a downturn. So right now, we're in the perfect storm of having more students wanting to come to the City University campuses. Um, so this great good work is very inspiring, but it's also very challenging. We've had, um, we have to try to provide space for all of the students who are, are coming as our enrollments grow. And the interesting thing is that our full-time equivalent students are growing faster than our headcount, which means that We've got more students on campus for a longer period of time, needing more amenities, needing more study space, and more support uh, services than when we were more of just a commuter uh, university. Our facilities portfolio consists of over 26 million gross square feet and 299 buildings. We range from the Graduate Center, which is a single building, to the campus of um, the College of Staten Island, which is 203 acres. Over 60% of our building stock was built before 1975, which means that in addition to modernizing the instructional and administrative spaces, we also have, uh, we have to address the significant infrastructure issues due to critical maintenance uh, and deferred maintenance. Our capital pro uh, budget is approximately $4 billion worth of funding over the next five years, which comes from the state, the city, and public-private partnerships. The state of New York provides 100% of funding for our senior colleges and 50% of funding for our community colleges, with the remaining 50% coming from the city of New York. Um, we have 15 large-scale projects right now in, pros in progress, and those are projects at or over 100,000 square feet. Um, these will build or renovate uh, considerable amounts of additional space for our campuses. But even with all of these projects, at the rate that we've been growing, we um, 
feel that we need probably another nine and a half million square feet um, to deal with all of this growth. So we really have to be efficient with what we can build. And interestingly is that we have 3.6 million square feet of assignable space today, more than we had in the 1970s when we were at our last peak. But even with the additional space, because instruction has changed and because uh, technology has changed, the learning environments really require different space, so we're really not at that much of an advantage. I want to stop for a moment and focus on the fact that CUNY is an integrated university. This means that we can hold a meeting once a month with all 23 provosts, 23 vice presidents of administration, 23 registrars, whoever we want, we can bring together and we can talk about whatever the issues are and we can find solutions together, we can look at and learn from best practices. This also allows us to implement things like software packages across the entire university system. So things like managing classroom scheduling, resource 25 or schedule 25 um, can be used to help manage those resources. We have Archibus for our space management, so all 26 million square feet live in a database. Every drawing has a polyline around each and every room. It tells us what building it is, what floor it is, how many square feet, who uses it. Um, you know, we can also add information there for our classrooms for things like what technology is there to help uh, feed other systems. We have an enterprise resource planning tool. Um, it's a project called CUNY First, which manages financial, student, and HR data. Um, and in turn, because we can use all of these things, we can hold everyone to the same standards and we can um, use the same efficiencies. Our, our close proximity also benefits our students. For instance, if a Hunter student needs to take a biology class this semester and the courses that they need are all full, they can't get into it, they can just take a bus downtown to Baruch, enroll in a biology class there, and be able to continue with their progress in a timely way. So in some respects, we can be tighter and leaner, but it also means that we have to think beyond an individual institution's needs when we're doing master planning. We have to think of the impact of how that campus also serves other campuses. So now that you know where we are and who we are, I'll share a little bit with you about um, some of our initiatives. Chancellor Matthew Goldstein um, has designated 2005 to 2015 as the decade of science at CUNY, renewing the university's commitment to creating a healthy pipeline to science, math, technology, and engineering fields by advancing science at the highest levels, training students to teach in these areas, and encouraging young people to study in these disciplines. This initiative can't succeed without the facilities that provide the right accommodations for the research and instruction to happen. And I've been working with the colleges in the central office for many years, and the conversations about uh, the planning for the decade of the sciences started well over 10 years ago. Back in 1999, we began examining our science facilities and identifying the need not only to um, replace, but also to increase the instructional and research laboratories throughout the university system, particularly at our senior colleges. City, Brooklyn, Hunter, Queens colleges has, have historically offered our flagship programs in the sciences, with City and Hunter colleges leading the university in research dollars. Um, and about the same time we started these surveys, Lehman College was emerging um, their science leadership through their doctoral program offerings in biology and their relationship with the New York Botanical Garden. So the sheer volume of obsolete facilities and the additional space required for our sciences was daunting. As you know, science facilities are expensive to build. We had to think about how we could deploy our resources without duplicating expensive science research at multiple campuses. And because we're an integrated university, the idea of the Advanced Science Research Center came about. We refer to it as the ASRC, and it will be built up at the City College campus. It's been designed by FLAD and KPF, and it is a resource where faculty from across the university will be able to come together and use um, very expensive specialized equipment. And the two buildings, this is the uh, ASRC, and on the other side is a individual science building built specifically for City College, and together they have uh, on some underground space with uh, shared, um, shared scientific equipment down there. So efficiency and flexibility are the guiding principles for the design of the ASRC and all of the science buildings that we're doing throughout CUNY. In the past, research laboratories were designed as individual spaces for, spe for a specific discipline. And as you can see in the upper drawing, um, these spaces, once allocated, were very difficult to take back. So if someone had a research grant and they no longer had funding, we couldn't take the, the space back. And therefore, senior faculty had a lot of research space and new junior faculty couldn't get any uh, 
real estate to be able to do their research. So our new buildings have been built on the idea of open labs, wherein bench space or modules will be assigned based on the grants a faculty member uh, receives. And so this on the right is showing you a floor plan of what the uh, ASRC will be like. Additionally, the labs are designed for cross-disciplinary research. The use of modules, unlike segregated individual rooms, will foster collaborative research just through the sheer proximity of researchers being close to each other. On the left is a bird's eye view of one floor of the ASRC with labs in the lower portion um, and the office space for faculty and student researchers up on the upper right. And on the right is a view of the open labs. We visited a number of other institutions while we were in early design phase, and we saw this throughout um, at Princeton, at Yale, at other folks. Um, if you've been to a Society for College and University Planners conference in the past few years, you've seen this is the direction that everyone's going in um, because we all have the same budget and space limitations. These are images of Lehman College's new science facility. On the left is a rendering of the northeast corner of the building as it meets the central walk of the campus. And the image on the right is the courtyard of the building. Lehman's premier science programs focus on plant sciences and ecology. And as such, um, there's an interesting element in the project. We've designed this um, in collaboration with the New York Botanical Gardens. They actually invited the researchers from the Botanical Gardens to come into our meetings early during the design process so that we didn't duplicate the things that they had available um, on their facilities. Um, for the learning environment, students will have access to research facilities on both the campus and at the gardens. And furthermore, we've designed this to a LEED Platinum standard, and the interior courtyard will have a living machine that uses plant life to recycle water for toilets and urinals in the building. It will be built in two phases. It, the entire building has been designed by Perkins and Will. It's in construction now, and the first phase will open, I believe, in 2012. At Queens College, Mitchell Gergler, um, Architects designed in addition to Remsen Hall, which is one of the college's four science buildings. The new wing houses mostly instructional space and a minor amount of research space. The building was completed um, in 2009. And what's nice about it is it, it picks up off where the existing building is. It uses the stairwells and the bathrooms from the existing building, but it provides a lot of usable space immediately for us that we can now take um, vacated space in the, the old building, which is I think a 1950s building. And the first time I went into one of the labs, I said, no one, no one teaches in here. No one goes in here. It was so old and decrepit and smelly. If I could bring the smell, you would really know what I was talking about. Um, so this now allows us to go back into those old spaces and um, renovate the rest of the building. One of the really great things along the building is this glass um, corner of the building, which has student lounges, and it's right on the quad of the campus. And the students, it doesn't matter if they're not science students, they're hanging out there because it's really good space um, and really inviting. And the, the transformation, even though it's incremental, is really telling them that we value their research and we want to invest in their instruction. So um, the projects I've talked with you about so far have been large-scale, multi-million dollar projects. but in, um, and they take time and money to move forward. We also have to con conduct smaller CUNY-wide science lab upgrades. In 2007, Vice Chancellor Weinshall made a commitment to renovate individual labs on campuses, incrementally improving their short-term conditions. So we've done, uh, the first five labs were completed in spring of 2010. We're now well on our way into the next batch of labs, just upgrading finishes and so forth. Um, our critical maintenance program started in 2007 with support from the State University Construction Fund. CUNY completed a building condition assessment survey using software, software developed by the SCUF, and the results were analyzed by Pacific Partners Consulting Group. We used this information to create a capital budget request to the state, which was over $2 billion of uh, system-wide need. And since my time is coming close, I'm going to move a little faster. We have received $284 million each year from the state to um, begin to work on our infrastructure projects, and those include fire alarms, facade uh, restorations, mechanical systems. It, it doesn't matter if the classrooms are great and state of the art if the building itself can't support them. This pie chart just shows how the critical maintenance um, across the university is broken up into the various um, pieces. And having this data and being able to track it is also really good for us in our lobbying efforts because we're able to go in and clearly state this is the things that we need to do. 
go back a year later and say these are the projects that we started, go back two years later and say these are the projects that are complete. So when we're talking with the elected officials about giving us the money, the fact that we really have an organized method and we can show what's happening is very beneficial in that conversation. Just quickly, I'll share a little bit with you about our John Jay project, which is a 625,000 square foot building located between 10th and 11th Avenues, 58th Street to 59th Street, literally right outside my window. Um, and anyone who's a planner here knows the length of time it sometimes takes a project to, to uh, come to fruition. It was one of the first projects I started on 15 years ago when I started at CUNY. It will open partially this fall and fully next spring. It has classrooms, it has laboratories, it has student services, it has student club space, it has the whole myriad of everything that we can need for a campus. We could have made completely an academic building, we could have made completely a student services building, but John Jay's space deficit was so great, we really needed to marry the two and kind of make it a 50-50 building. It's been designed by Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill. Uh, very quickly, I'll share with you our Hunter School of Social Work. This is our um, public-private. Um, we sold a building on 79th Street, and we are moving the School of Social Work uptown. And um, it's well underway, and will open in 2012. And with that, I will pass it on to Leah. So this is the Lilliput stop on this... Um, part of the Gulliver's Travels, and I get to show you things at a smaller scale than you've heard until now. Um, a little bit of background, I don't know how many of you know that we have all of these schools that you've heard about that you may not know belong to the new school. Uh, you probably all heard of Parsons, which is now the largest part of the new school. It's, it's a school of design. Um, Manus, uh, a world-class conservatory, is part of the new school, uh, an undergraduate school. Um, called Eugene Lang. Uh, we have a School of Management, a School of Drama, a School of Social Research. It started in 1919 and grew by accretion, uh, acquiring some of these um, divisions as it went along. And the fact of these divisions having their own life coming together as um, Megan talked about an integrated university is very much an issue for us. Um, Arrow. Um, You've seen the statistics, I don't need to dwell on them. Um, we are located in Greenwich Village. This is a very abstract map, but basically it's Union Square, Washington Square, Fifth Avenue, 14th Street, and all of these red dots are our, our buildings. We have some outliers, uh, uh, the dram drama school down on, on the Lower West Side. Uh, Manus is uptown on West 85th Street. Um, we have a presence in uh, the fashion district. And that's just a 3D uh, version of it with um, Union Square, Washington Square down there, Fifth Avenue, and 14th Street. Uh, the center of gravity of campus actually is at 13th and 5th. Um, we are developing this Fifth Avenue corridor for student services, the 13th Street corridor for technical buildings with shops and the rest of it. This is the original building designed by Joseph Urban. It's the founding building. And in fact, it's the only purpose-built building that we have, the only building that was built as an educational institution for the new school. Um, and so our infrastructure, uh, I took that to mean our priorities, our investments, where uh, we invest um, in, in the common needs of all of these <coughs> divisions, which are really quite different. So um, we are determined by our environment. We're determined by where we are. We're determined by the density of the village, the fact that it's very expensive to find space, and the space needs to be productive, so it's very highly scheduled. A free mixing space, social space, is very difficult to come by. Outdoor space, um, dedicated out outdoor space doesn't exist, so the campus is the city and therefore um, all of our buildings need to relate to the city, need to relate to the street uh, of necessity. Um, and because we don't have purpose-built buildings, we've been in the business of transforming existing commercial buildings for educational uses, and as all of you architects know, that's very different, it's very difficult. Uh, buildings come with uh, um, structural spans, come with uh, limited elevators, um, 
come with a few windows on, this, uh, on the perimeter or very large floor plates if we're lucky enough to get a large floor plate. Um, they're old, their infrastructure is aging, and um, we need to uh, bring to them technology. And we're very much in the business of balancing books, which take space, uh, and laptops, which mostly travel and mostly just take um, wiring, um, and of course, sustainability. Um, so I'm just some examples, uh, old buildings, um, the Parsons building at 5th Avenue and 13th Street, this is just a few years ago, um, really in, in sad shape sort of a building. This, um, this pretty doorway there uh, led to this um, place. And looking at it from above, you could see there was a mechanical, mechanical room on top of a little workshop and it all looked like that. There's your trash in the mechanical room from above. And we scooped it all out and uh, created an indoor quadrangle because all our quadrangles and all our outdoor space turns out to be interior. And it's skylit um, that this is the path of the trash. This is where the trash was. Um, the building that carried mechanical was demolished. Uh, that's the roof. And uh, then it was connected to the street. And these themes come over and over. These are the, the priorities that everything we do need to, to be integrated. So there's the open space, there's the trash somewhere behind, and now all of this is um, open to the street. Um, I'm showing you this. Um, there's a long story about these windows, which I'll touch on, but the Parsons complex are these three buildings. This, this beautiful red brick building, this tiny awful um, uh, building, awful because I'll tell you, just in terrible shape. And then this building, um, and, and this is the floor levels of each of these buildings. They're all at, 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 at floor levels like this, and trying to make a connection between them is, is challenging to say the least, and then you end up with things like that. Um, it's in the same space, but trying to make those connections, sometimes they're visual rather than um, by stairs, which you have to, have to uh, go all around. Um, and so the relationship to the street is an important mandate. Um, here is that building from the outside. This, this is a, uh, an interpretation of the building code signage, which um, uh, I, I shouldn't waste time with anecdotes, but the, the height of a sign is limited to uh, 12 inches, uh, but doesn't say how deep it can go. And so um, <laughs> that's our sort of kind of canopy sign. Um, and um, these windows, uh, I, I don't want to go all the way back, but the windows that you saw before started up much higher. They were lowered. We cut some beautiful granite to, and paid good money to do this, uh, which is why I talk about these are the priorities. This is what we're spending money on. Um, the windows were lowered and tilted out to meet the street, and so um, they also become sitting and social space, which we just don't have enough of. This is the inside of that. This particular wall turns around, opens up, and becomes a crit space uh, for the design school. Um, so you can see it inside out. And um, a lot of uh, exhibit space back there is that former trash path. Um, and again, um, this is to show you that across the street. So this is Fifth Avenue, and this is 13th Street. Um, across the street here, uh, this was a former Citibank building. Uh, everything we have is a former office building or bank building. Um, this now is the Milano School of, of Public Policy, uh, but when Citibank left, this is, um, we boarded up those, wall, those windows, and this is now our welcome center, uh, which means coming in off the street and, and getting all the information you want about the new school uh, this is the room on the inside. This is that wall that you see from the street, and this is looking back to the street. Monitors with information on both sides. Um, so commercial buildings, my biggest headache is elevators. Uh, well, right next to air conditioning, which is right next to everything else. But I'm just showing you this because elevators are extraordinarily important. And the problem is uh, moving classes within the bell schedule, within the 15, 20 minutes of time, vertically um, and, and, and getting them in and out of elevators. Elevators are extraordinarily difficult and extraordinarily important. And uh, we should have added, oh, many, many elevators when we did this building, but we couldn't afford to do that. What we did, and in fact, 
was the purpose of the project to connect the lower levels of all of these buildings, which you saw the levels were all, that's why you saw that ramp and stairs, um, so that the elevators are at least reachable from within. They used to have to go outside to the different lobbies of each of these buildings and take each of these elevators. Uh, it was a little bit difficult. Um, I'll get back to elevators because I have to. Um, this um, um, is a view down Fifth Avenue. This is 16th Street, and this building is one of these buildings um, that we've taken a great deal of space in. We're now, um, you know, three quarters um, into this building. And um, I'll explain why we're here in a second, but just to show you again about elevators. Um, we are have transformed what was a service entrance into this building into the academic entrance. The Fifth Avenue entrance remains the entrance for the remaining tenants. So this is what that looked like, and this is what we did of it. Brand new elevators. This is underneath a Coke store storage, so it's very low ceilings, kind of fancied it up to make it work. But it's all about these elevators and, and going down and, and capturing every inch of space because as all of you have said and will say, space is extremely scarce and extremely uh, valuable. Sharing the light, um, the perimeter uh, windows, our work environments are like this to the greatest extent possible. That is for administrators and for staff. Space for faculty is a rather different story. Faculty have a history of having private offices um, on the one hand. Um, the balance there is with interdisciplinary cooperation, meeting, seeing each other, working together. And um, I have more words than images to show you about that. Um, but uh, we're making a, a tremendous effort and a lot of progress actually in getting faculty to share offices, time share rather than space share, and uh, have more than one in an office. And um, a lot of very interesting things um, uh, ensue. So uh, gathering space is a priority for innovation. I'm just gonna show you one big room that we renovated um, for, for lectures. And um, student spaces are, are a priority for renovation. This is a, a little bridge between uh, the two buildings, um, the two original buildings that we've made into a gallery for students. Again, small um, transformations uh, for our, our um, priorities. Um, books, um, Arnhold Hall is our knowledge center. It's a very technology rich building. It's where computer labs are very um, sophisticated software for design for, uh, we don't have science buildings. This is our um, high level technology and workshops. Um, and um, we needed to make space for the library which was in one of the buildings that um, was torn down, which I'll show you in a minute. And um, it was literally um, a, an exercise in finding interstitial spaces that weren't intensely used. And if it's not intensely used, it's gotta get intensely used. And so um, spaces like this, which is, um, the New School has a fabulous art collection including commissioned art. You're looking at a solid wood there and a lot of other um, art. But this is um, the a breakout space, if you will, uh, outside of a space to, to the right of this picture, which is a uh, major um, meeting space, and um, we um, turned it into a student laptop space. Um, one of the really, um, one of the things I'm most proud of, mind you, here is that we buried conduit in this floor invisibly, and there's actually a laptop outlets in this floor um, because that's what student needed. This is what this looked like before. They're now lined with books. Um, um, we integrated a library into this building, and we basically married books with technology, with food, with gathering space. Um, outraging and scandalizing each constituency and each stakeholder for each of those uh, <laughs> um, parts. The, the computer people do not want coffee next to their keyboards, and the book people don't want uh, people chatting, and, and so it went. Um, but it turns out to work. There's a corridor, and we put books in it. Um, and we made a reading room into what used to be an underutilized uh, room over on the side. And this hallway became the um, circulation desk and uh, food directly next to the books. And those 
kinds of uh, problems, ouch, two minutes, okay. Um, the opportunity uh, to have a purpose built, to have a custom building for the new school arose on uh, this site at Fifth Avenue and 14th Street. Uh, it's, a, it's a good site, it used to be occupied by that building down there. This building is two blocks north of that. And the issues remain the same, except that it's not an existing commercial building, and it's not an old building. And um, the expense of real estate, um, I'm, let, me, let me just go through this because I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to show you multiple pictures. Um, building has a two stories below grade and seven stories above of academic space, uh, nine stories of residential above, the highest and best used uh, at this kind of space. As I was telling you, it's very hard to get students up into the taller spaces, so that's residential. Um, the, uh, the prime, uh, the pride of place and the prime space is given over to social spaces, to student spaces, and, and, to, the, and to the light. Um, the solution to vertical transportation is stairs. So this is regularizing a, a, a span. I'm not gonna go through that, uh, but organizing the building so that the light uh, is brought to, uh, to the greatest extent possible. And where that happens is where we have so-called interactive spaces or quadrangles which are open. Those are our major uh, public spaces and they're connected by stairs. Uh, they're connected by stairs on each of the three sides of the building, um, uh, like so. And the way we did this was to reinvent the fire stair. The fire stair is, um, you know, they're stairs. We have them in all these commercial buildings and we can never use them, they're fire stairs. So we have a fire stairs, a fire stair that has an open stair on top. It's sort of a double decker and the open stairs link all of these public spaces. Um, that's the fire stair, that's the public stair. Um, and you read it on the exterior of the building. The stairs all occur on the outside um, and I'm really gonna just fly through these. Um, and well, this is just to show our big auditorium, you know, is flexible. Everything is about flexibility. Everything's about doing more than one thing at the same time. Um, some of this has changed. The lights no longer look like that. Uh, but the outside of the building does look like that, and I can tell you about it. A lot of uh, work with uh, light and sustainability and using daylight and capturing daylight. And, um, let me just see if there's anything here. That's what those look like. Library, very little library, green group, only because there's a setback, zoning, blame zoning, or thank zoning for the setback. Um, and so that's what that kind of looks like with all of those stairs, and we're doing a tremendous amount of sustainability, and, um, and I could stop there. I have, I have a lot of information about all of that, if anybody's <laughs> interested. Um, we're doing a lot with BIM, and um, uh, the uh, space planner in our office is uh, connected with all of these schools. That's what this looked like uh, two days ago, and that's what it's going to look like when it's done. So we have a, we have a little more time. Um, we have the lights, and if everyone, oh, sorry. We have one more presentation. The new school. <laughs> I'm very glad to be here with all of my colleagues from other New York City universities, as well as um, the Columbia alumni. Um, so many of you, or probably all of you, are familiar with one of NYU's campuses, the one in Washington Square. And this next slide, you will see what NYU now really considers to be its campus. And one of our primary initiatives right now is to be looking at NYU as a global network university. The blue dots are what we call portal campuses, New York City being one of them, Abu Dhabi being the other, and what a portal campus means is it's a campus that's a four-year university, under, undergrad, four-year liberal arts, 
university with research institutions. The red dots are what we call academic centers. These really function more as study abroad sites that are run by NYU. The other initiative that we have going on, going slightly smaller in scale, is a citywide initiative. Um, if you take Phillips numbers for Columbia, um, where Columbia has 360 square feet per student, NYU has 160 square feet per student, and we currently have um, 12 million square feet in our inventory, and we're projecting to grow in the next 25 years by six million square feet. And because of the constraints of the village that Leah has already introduced, um, we realized pretty quickly that that can't all happen in Washington Square. And so we looked at two other strategies for growing different types of programs within New York City. One is um, the neighborhood, and there are functions that we've thought that could grow into the neighborhood, such as undergrad dorms, administrative, administrative functions, and some graduate programs. Then on the remote sites, um, we've looked at l harvesting opportunities or seeking opportunities um, away from Washington Square and the neighborhood where we already have centers or where there are new opportunities, such as Governor's Island. Um, now going even more micro to, to in scale, um, third initiative that I'm talking about today is sustainability. And um, both the, the culture of, um, you know, here you see the diagram of the building culture, how the, the shift towards sustainability in our projects is um, very well integrated into our planning. And we are partnering with the cities and Bloomberg's plan to reduce carbon emissions by 30%. And I think the target date is 2017, and we've already achieved that in 2011. Um, but on the, you know, on the small anecdotal level, I can say that the culture at NYU is such that if I'm caught in a meeting with a water bottle like this, I will get a lecture. And so the, <laughs> so we were, you know, we're all with our reusable aluminum bottles. And, um, and also if I am caught in a meeting with a presentation like this, with one sided paper, I will get a 10 minute lecture on double-sided printing, and so I will have lost my chance to actually discuss the topic that I came to the meeting for. So, so we've all learned very quickly to change to change our habits, to turn off the lights when we leave the restroom. It's it's things like that that are very um, that have worked their way into the the culture of the university. And so I think as a planner, um, by doing all those small things, it actually I think has it allows us to think. Um, every step of the way about how to introduce sustainable practices into our planning. Um, Carol also um, suggested that talking about how do you plan and do design projects in the challenging economy right now in the time of diminishing resources. And I think that the first, the first step is that we really do do a lot more planning and that it's a, to a higher level, <laughs> that most projects, even very small projects, you know, a renovation of a, of a 1,000 square foot space, um, from that to a um, 250,000 square foot building, will take all the way through feasibility studies with programming and cost estimates, cost estimators will be retained. Some of these studies are, um, just could be a you know, six week exercise, um, and other times it's a multi-year exercise, but that, just brings to the point that there's no such thing as a project that goes over budget because there's nothing that um, a university administrator or university leadership likes less than that. Um, and there's nothing that is also less appealing to the provost than a faculty member who is told that their special um, countertop material has been value engineered. So um, the more planning that happens up front, the more satisfied you, the leadership and the faculty. Um, and then in terms of how that actually works out on a project level, um, this, the second point is we use the constraints to inspire creativity. 
because the project budgets aren't as big as we all would like them to be. And so we, we've, we've come up with this um, little diagram we, we like to call it think inside the box and that we use the constraints to inspire creativity. And as planners and architects, um, I think, and I'm an architect as well, I th you know, I, you always want the bigger budget, but then it, it's the really creative kind of idea sometimes kicks in when you're really up against um, a wall or a steam pipe and you have to then um, work within that to come up with new and fresh ideas. So we do find that often on a project, um, there ends up being an opportunity, especially to give the designers uh, a chance to have one big idea. And in this, this case, I'm showing a project that is under construction right now. It's the Global Center for Academic and Spiritual Life. Um, you can see the statistics. It is on Washington Square South, just below Washington Square Park. You can see it to the left. Um, well, to the left is the Kimmel Center, to the right is Judson Church, and in this particular project, I would say that the biggest constraint was that the form and the massing was set. And the architects, Machado Silvetti, played with the skin. And it's being installed right now. It's a perforated granite that has a, in the front of the building, facing Washington Square, it's, it's a rain screen, and that's kind of expensive, but it's only used in very few parts of the building, but the material wraps around the building in a much more economical construction. The investment we are making in infrastructure um, with the cogeneration plant that actually just opened um, fall of 2010. It's providing 25 buildings with electricity, 40 buildings with heat, hot, and chilled water, and we're reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by 23%. We sell power back to the grid during off-peak times, and we do still buy power from Con Ed during peak times. Here's a photograph when it was under construction. Now to talk about the 25-year plan. Um, this plan started six years ago, and that coincided with when our office was conceived, the Office of Planning and Design. And it was seen that in order to, this is again the same, the same slide, in order to grow at the rate that was projected, we would have to go outside of the neighborhood of, of uh, Washington Square. The strategy for remote sites, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly since we already touched on it. Um, since we started the planning office, NYU has merged with Brooklyn Poly, and so capitalizing on that relationship now is a great opportunity for NYU to be growing some centers there. Um, we are now under construction of a school for dentistry and nursing up by the health corridor. So these are functions that have now left Washington Square and are going to their sort of affinity locations. Governor's Island, um, we've, we're, we're in consideration for future developments there. And in the neighborhood, again, this is possibilities for administrative groups, some academics can go outside of this 10-minute walking radius and certainly um, undergraduate housing. Now we get to some pictures. Um, the, the core of the campus, many of you will recognize um, Washington Square Village. This was one of two redevelopment sites and those two um, redevelopment sites were super blocks uh, we're seen to have opportunities and similar to what Philip was saying that it's very, we were looking for opportunities where there wasn't a lot of demolition, need for relocation of, of schools or residences of a, um, of a certain magnitude. And so here, the, um, you'll see the site plan. Um, this is the existing site plan. I think I can use this. Um, we have some 
underutilized space here, which is, these are Department of Transportation strips along the side, and these were part of a street widening initiative when, um, during urban renewal, and the, they are park space, they've been used as park space in the last 40, 50 years, but they're all blocked by fences, and so it doesn't feel like park space, and in fact, those fences also block off the, the, the access to the, the open space that's within, and so there were opportunities here to improve those park spaces as well as add the density that we needed. Now, did that do what I wanted it to do? There you go. Here's the new site plan, and um, we've been working with a design team of Grimshaw with um, Toshiko Mori and MVVA, as well as two of our in-house planners went to Columbia, Will Haas and Renee Barrio, went to Columbia Grad School in Planning. Um, and so here we have improved, we have, we're proposing to work with the, the culture of each of these, um, like this, 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 the North Block had this more, more open space and park, so we've made it, we've taken away these fences to bring people in on these edges and um, created academic buildings here. On the North Block, 40% of the square footage is below grade. And on the South Block, the Silver Towers complex right here, the property was landmarked. And so we are actually sort of building upon enhancing the definition and visibility of that landmark site. You can see here the, the before, this is one of the DOT strips where you can see there's a park that's not exactly a welcoming or inviting park in the open space beyond. We're proposing to convert it to a much more lush and welcoming park experience. This is the boundary between Silver Towers right here and the Coles Gymnasium. So this is a pedestrian walkway, but it doesn't feel like that, and I have two minutes left, so I'm gonna get to the Abu Dhabi and Shanghai. So here's the improved pedestrian walkway. Shanghai campus was just announced we have been in discussion with the government of Shanghai, the government of Pudong, the developer, the Ministry of Education of China, and we are developing a site in the commercial district. The developer has already done plans for this building. We have just engaged with KPF in Shanghai, working with the New York City office, to do our best to have our academic priorities met within the floor plate that was already designed by the developer. The big, what the big shift you see here is in order to accommodate classrooms of different sizes to move the core. And then as well as on the exterior, so instead of looking like this, we're hoping it can look like that or along the lines of giving it some more institutional gravitas and warmth. Um, the Abu Dhabi campus is a partnership with the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and NYU. We have a temporary campus that's open right now with a first small class of students, but we've been working for the last few years with um, Rafael Vignoli's office to be developing a master plan. And right now we're in design development for the new site on Sadiat Island. In orange you see the siding. This is the cultural island. Guggenheim, Frank Gehrig's Guggenheim will be our neighbor. The, this is the, um, the, we had three different kind of space planning, master planning types, and here the challenge is we're trying to create these campuses that somehow reflect NYU, um, and NYU being in the sort of the dense urban campus, it's very different than the space opportunities and types of construction and planning that you have in, um, in Abu Dhabi. So the model that we used that felt most kind of evocative of NYU 
was the was the souk, which is the kind of the, the old Arab markets that have a kind of a low scale but um, intimate feel. And lastly, here is the comparison of the NYU campus at Washington Square and the site plan of the planned campus in Abu Dhabi. And these are to scale. And um, so not only do you see that this campus over here is going to have 2,400 students, and the campus in Washington Square has about 40,000 students, that it is actually a different experience, but yet there, um, there is some kind of rel there will be some relative connections about um, the connections between the buildings. And I did want to mention one thing that continues the conversation we had amongst my, my university colleagues, which was about the time it takes to build a building and to do planning in complex areas, which is that um, the 2031 plan we started planning six years ago um, for building on the super blocks at Washington Square, and we hope to have something, something in the ground by 2017. The Abu Dhabi campus we started planning three years ago, and we'll have something by 2014. The Shanghai campus we started planning a week ago, and we'll have something open by 2014, same time as Abu Dhabi and before Washington Square. <laughs> Thank you very much. faculty offices on my brain right at the moment. So um, could I ask you um, how you're dealing with them? If you have, um, if you're even thinking about shared space, um, uh, hoteling, uh, timeshare, uh, multi, um, any way to? Um, we think about it all the time, <laughs> and we have very little headway. Um, there is a lot of sharing for adjuncts. Um, if they have any office space, it's shared, but for full-time tenured faculty, it's, it's windowed. It's windowed offices. Um, administration. Where do you get all those offices? Where do you get all those windows? <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. Who, who else wants to go here? From CUNY's point of view, we, we have the same issues, and I, we're actually um, undertaking a space guideline update so we're looking at all of our space standards across the university and figuring things out. So I've been doing a lot of research while we were selecting a consultant to work with us on this, and I've gone through a lot of old planning files, and shared offices were proposed in the 1960s, and they never, they never happened. I'm not sure how it's gonna happen going forward, but one of the things that we do is we do plan um, as much office space as we can for our adjuncts so that we assign three of them to an office so that if we can convert those adjunct lines to full time lines, we have office space for them. But we can't do that everywhere, so we do to also have to work with cubicles and shared spaces, um, also to bring the light into the buildings. You just need some of those. The one example that we do have is that we do let, there are some schools that do make choices. There are a few schools that will make a choice to have either non-windowed or smaller offices, and they then see the benefit of having more space for common shared area. So there are some more forward thinkers, and everyone is satisfied So I, I, I didn't get to show you the new building. Uh, we'll have something called faculty resources, which uh, the open space is by the window, and there's small spaces where they can go to have a private conversation or for small work, which is uh, one of many uh, types that we're um, trying to work. At and at so Columbia, I'll just uh, weigh in on this. At Columbia, we have space guidelines for uh, when we do renovations and new construction, but because of the um, age of many of our facilities um, on the Morningside campus, it's a very, very difficult problem uh, for both faculty and uh, for adjuncts, there's often um, uh, no space. We have many, many build, uh, schools with uh, severe um, space constraints at the moment. So it's, a, it's really a, um, 
uh, often hand-to-hand -hand combat as you go forward to figure out the right solution to um, satisfy the academic needs and the faculty needs. Funding is a major um, issue and lack of swing space and the ability to just work, um, continue uh, functioning and work uh, when you're trying to uh, renovate facilities is a very difficult matter. I, I think it's, it's interesting to note that we've um, heard from about development of over 500 million square feet of space and the real issue in the end is what the individual's workspace is all about. It's, you know, 50, 50 square feet of space or 100 square feet of space and, and what the individual is doing. I think it's just, it's nice to see that it comes back to something very human and, and tangible. There was, there was actually an article in the Chronicle within the last year about these faculty offices and shared spaces like Leah's suggesting. And there, I printed out the article and some of the comments for the space guidelines project that we're working on so that when we bring faculty in, we can say we're aware of this. And I printed out the first 100 comments. <laughs> and the majority of them from faculty were no, no, you don't know us, you don't listen, you don't like us. It was not, they, the concept of real estate and the value of real estate is very difficult. Um, it's gonna be interesting to bridge that. Uh, there's also real uh, issues um, in discussions with faculty about uh, thought time and, um, and quiet time and Many faculty who I speak with um, love to be in the classroom and with students, but also need, um, in some form or another, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a walled, um, completely private office, but uh, need the thought time uh, for uh, uh, research and reflection, yet want to be with their colleagues as well. And these, these, these are all. Um, great goals and figuring out the, the way to satisfy those goals is, is I think, much more difficult than um, a new development might seem to be uh, to people. But that, that's really where um, uh, the, um, uh, the, some of the toughest uh, solutions um, have to be, problems have to be found and, and solutions found. Yeah. I, this, I don't want this to just be our private conversation. It was went on for an hour before and we're continuing it. Does anyone else want to add anything or have questions? Charles? A lot of universities outside of New York are spending a lot of money on um, student amenities, uh, uh, physical, uh, I guess, gyms and that sort of thing in order to attract students. I didn't hear much about that from any of you, and I'm wondering if that's because uh, New York is the amenity, or are you also finding the need to, to build more of those uh, recreational facilities for students? I'll take that right now. I, it, it's interesting. I think that the, I think that there's a, it can go, that, that it swings and right now um, the leadership at NYU isn't interested in amenities like gyms. Uh, the president before was very interested in it. Our president wants the world <laughs> and, um, and it will, I'm sure it will probably swing back. The, I think amenities like student lounges and dorms, yes, it's important to get those spaces to be appointed in a decent way, but not on a capital scale. I think for CUNY, for most of the students that, that we attract, there are certainly athletic programs and some of the schools have bigger to stronger programs than others, but I wouldn't say the athletics are the main draw for CUNY. And um, like NYU, our biggest um, request for space from students is generally um, study space and group study space. About 10 years ago, we heard very much that CUNY students don't have computers. You need to create lots of computer labs, computers for everyone. And we really don't hear that now. They pretty much have laptops or access through school or work, wherever they're at home. You know, the prices have gone down so much. But what we really hear is that they need space to work together in groups and quiet study space that they can really do their work. Yeah, I would echo that uh, in my conversations. Uh, that, is, that is exactly what I hear. And uh, we are making uh, a significant investment in athletic facilities at Baker Field. But beyond that, um, we hear that uh, from students, they want places uh, for study space and uh, uh, those casual uh, connections um, and the serendipity, serendipitous uh, uh, interactions. Um, and one of our challenges is to keep up with uh, the students. Many come out of high school with technology 
and uh, social networking experiences that are more robust um, than what we have uh, at Columbia in our existing facilities. So keeping up with that and trying to figure out what all that means uh, from a spatial point of view is, uh, I think, a real challenge over the next few years. Um, uh, Phys Ed facilities lose uh, in the context, uh, in the contest uh, with an academic space. Uh, it's just expensive and large and we can't afford it. The new building uh, went through about 37 schemes of which the, you know, 32 had a gym uh, and a pool on the lower level or half a gym and half a pool and a little gym and a big pool and uh, ultimately couldn't afford it. Are you talking about more outdoor space on the Morningside campus? Is that, is that what you mean? Um, it's really the limitations of space that we have on the campus. I mean, uh, the low library steps and probably low library is the signature, you know, mental element that people walk away with um, about the center of the campus in the, the, the quad. Um, but uh, uh, more open space is, is, um, is is a problem now be just because of space constraints. In, in space design and planning these days, the, the buzzwords have been for quite a while about the learning landscape, you know, learning outside of the classroom, learning in the residential spaces, and also about interdisciplinary collaboration, certainly. And um, I think it's a really interesting and rich architectural issue, but I think it's a very complicated governance and ownership and management issue, all of it, about both the maintenance and operation of the spaces within the administration, the complexity about, you know, research dollars allocations and where they go to each department or where do faculty belong, et cetera. And I think that it, uh, the conversation between sort of space planning and administration is a really interesting one that we've been witnessing a lot. And I was wondering if any of you can kind of talk to some of these challenges that you've been facing and maybe some of the, you know, creative solutions that you're seeing. A couple of things at CUNY. We are doing a new science facility at Brooklyn, and for them, the decision of how much space we had in the first phase of the project, we could put, put part of the natural and behavioral sciences, or we could put, oh, you know, we could put biology and chemistry, but we couldn't put psychology. We went back and forth, and what we finally decided in the new plan is that it will be a lower level. So it'll be all of the first two years of sciences in one place, which will allow them to have more collaboration, interdisciplinary ideas. Um, and then we'll go back and uh, renovate the existing facility that they have for the research and the upper level courses. So we've, you know, we've kind of tried to work with it with that. Um, at the new John Jay building, one of the things that we've looked at with space and the collaboration and how to assign space, because it is hard when you start to get territories, to be able to reconfigure that later on. So what we created, instead of giving English an entire floor of the new tower on 11th Avenue, we said you get half of the floor and then you stack the other half and we put small departments kind of coupling with them so that each has a front door on the main level, but in the back the space bleeds so that if the small department grows we can take more uh, office space from English, and if English grows, we can take more space. So we've tried to find ways to, to kind of blur barriers and not make things so territorial. But it is a challenge, um, particularly for a place like John Jay, where they're getting a 625,000 square foot building. That's huge. Mm. They need to. Mm. Their space will still be at 66 square feet mm. per student at the <laughs> end of the day, not even close to the 110 that we would like to give each of our senior campuses. So one of the challenges is that they're so good at multi-using space is that they would say, oh, the black box can be for performances and it can be for student events and it can be for community gathering and it can be for, and at the end of the day, as great as it was to think of all of these multi-uses, the challenge is gonna be how are they going to ensure that the academic program stays at first priority and is able to assign and use that space when the time comes. So they're really gonna have to have the building management and, and 
you know, I work in central office, so we help them plan, but we give them the buildings and then they have to manage them. So the college is gonna really have to think about that and how they can, um, particularly in this fiscal time, keep the academic pieces running without trying to use it as rental space or other things. So we've, all been, we've all been talking about physical space and the, con and the constraints that we all have operating in New York, but have you thought about solving your problems in, in terms of using technology and media and, and, and your, we had a session today on communication um, and, and social media. So have you been thinking about you know, more webinars or, and I understand that we, we do need to, as individuals, to learn and persuade them to be together, but in some circumstances, you can also use technology. Our online uh, distant learning um, has grown some huge percentage, maybe, you know, 50% over the last something like five years. We're very conscious of, of doing more uh, electronically. Uh, we do more, you know, storage offsite, uh, more, more books offsite. We do um, as much as we can uh, to, to not take up space and free up space for uh, you know, think of, of learning not a student in a book, but student in another student, a student in several students to, to free up space for the social aspect um, rather than for the physical aspect. We, we do um, a lot, probably we could do more, but we do think about it all the time. Is anyone not using um, media and distance learning at this point? Uh, I would just say um, for that question, uh, I think it's a very fundamental question, uh, especially when we look at some of these projects that take from conception to inception to completion um, almost a, a generation uh, to think about how we're going to be using technology um, to advance teaching and learning. And it's a very, uh, I, I haven't found a complete answer yet uh, to it. And lots and lots of people are thinking about the classroom of the future, um, but we're all doing it in an environment of uh, today and faculty today trying to figure this out, yet the people who will benefit from it are in junior high school or elementary school at the moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, trying to conceive of how they want to effectively receive information and um, learn from it is uh, very difficult. Here at Columbia we are doing a lot, and, um, but uh, uh, not so much with distance learning um, at this point, but using technology quite a bit. But there's a lot more that we can do. And as we look at these investments in a very resource constrained time, it's just really hard to figure out what um, in, the, uh, in the far future will be the ways in which people uh, uh, learn. One small way that we've um, made a change, and this is, again, just being responsive to the, the students, which is that a lot of the computer labs are going away because of the different way that students use their computers, that rather than the room with many tables um, with computers, with desktops there, we will, we've um, created like a wider corridor outside of classrooms with areas for people to work with their laptops and they can work in groups in those kinds of areas. And then for um, the computer labs that would be used for teaching, for curriculum where you're using how to, how learning how to use certain software um, for GIS or something like that, they, the classes don't need to be taught in a dedicated lab with computers that are loaded with that software, but rather it can be a seminar room earlier in the day and then they have a laptop, you know, kind of trolley and that, or students can bring their own laptops and then just have like down, um, have a, what do you even call it? The, the virtual lab so you can just get a license when you're in that room. I gather, I've heard of a school that has a policy called every tub on its own bottom. And um, what they do basically is each of its constituent schools has to get its own funding or so they say. Um, how do you guys, is there a general rule for how you differ between schools that uh, have huge alumni funds and school, you know, divisions that don't 
and between schools that need six mile long cyclotrons and schools that basically just need a little atelier with a window? I mean, how, how do you approach the difference in disciplines? How do you approach the, both in terms of fundraising and in terms of space needs, dollars per square foot, that kind of thing? I'll, I'll take a crack at it. So um, I don't know if you're referring to Columbia or some other, some other institution, but uh, so uh, at Columbia, we can't proceed with a project unless we have a funding plan in place for it. So that doesn't necessarily mean funds in hand, but it's a, a realistic funding plan in order to go forward. Schools and programs that bring funding to the table can advance much more rapidly than those that don't. Those that don't have to compete um, against academic need uh, for other schools and programs identified by the provost and, and the deans for um, for funding, so um, it's not an easy equation, and for schools that aren't the ones that bring a lot of resources to the table, it's difficult and time-consuming, but we, um, as a general rule, do not proceed with a project unless we have a full funding plan uh, in place. NYU works the same way. Kinney being the public institution, we have to, on a yearly basis, produce a five-year request to the city and state. So we are constantly showing, you know, we drop a year, we add a year, we keep rolling. Um, in 98, we got our first five-year appropriation from the state, so we literally are getting money in five-year chunks. In the past, it was a five-year plan, but you got money every year. Um, and so all, we actually, I have a little book here that we do. We, we literally publish what we call the Bible. You're not, the colleges are told, you're not allowed to lobby uh, on it, offer <laughs> Any other book but this, it's everyone sings from the same one. And um, we prioritize based on need, based on space deficits. Um, the campuses go through master planning pretty much in a 10 year cycle. And you know, it's not, an, it's not a pie. There was a point where one of the presidents said, well, you know, I haven't gotten my share. And I did a little study and showed where 10 years ago when we redid your whole campus, your share was much bigger than anyone else's. So it's, it has to be done based on the need at the time. Um, and so we really go through and we really look and it, it's, there's campuses that have dramatic need and it's really hard to say that that money's gonna keep going to that campus for a while. Um, and once they get a turn at the trough, then someone else gets to come in. Not the same uh, uh, bottom, not the same top. Um, it's a integrated university. Um, some some uh, of the divisions uh, uh, have more revenue than others, some have more money than others, uh, a number of them are deficit divisions, we talk about it all the time, but uh, ultimately it's, it's very much integrated, um, and it's by need and by various other priorities. It's not every division on its own, top bottom. So I, I always um, wonder where these metaphors come from. Mm. I mean, how could a tub be on anything other than its bottom? Mm. Um, <laughs> so I don't know what the, the, the kind of counter model is. Um, but I, re I really wanted, to, I think it was a really wonderful panel, and uh, probably it's a historic first to have, to have really the facilities, you know, key, key people thinking about the facilities at these four key New York institutions to be at the same table at the same time, uh, thinking through this incredible issue. And as you could hear from what they're saying, they're really between a whole series of communities, and they're trying to basically pull off daily miracles um, in which uh, nobody being happy is the inevitable outcome. Um, and so what they try to do is make sure everybody's equally unhappy, and that's quite, <laughs> uh, quite difficult. Um, but we could have done the same panel, let's say, with a group of four academic leaders from, mm -hmm. from the same schools, or from four student leaders, from the, and, and you would have then you really started to develop, let's say, a layered understanding of where universities might be headed. But just to, I will give you a couple of quick observations. Um, um, it was, of course, long speculated in, uh, from the 1950s and 60s on that universities would be, by virtue of inf in information technologies, become dispersed global networks uh, of exchange. Uh, but quite the opposite has been the primary effect of information technologies, that, that uh, universities have become ever greater uh, uh, dense, dense concentrations uh, and that they are expanding and will not stop expanding. So you really have to not just try to digest the individual scenarios you saw here, but you really have to imagine something like the doubling of that amount of million square feet uh, in 25 years from now. And, and one way to understand that is, is 
society keeps asking universities to raise the level of their performance and their capacity and their broadband capacity as the questions get bigger. Our ability to address the questions gets better with technologies and with the new, um, th the very fact that we can network together actually enables us to identify questions that we didn't know exist before, so then we have to create a new department to examine them. So the very ability to disperse our knowledge concentrates again. So what you're seeing is an enormous expansion of university uh, uh, capacity. And this, the, 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 the forces that are asking the university to become bigger are not necessarily the forces of the city itself. And so what you ultimately end up with is conflict between the citizens of the city who wonder why it is that more and more of their city is becoming devoted to university. And I think this is, this is uh, just gonna keep going and going like this. Um, it sounds like um, recreational and athletic facilities fell away. Uh, faculty officers are on the way out. I mean, it's, there's a sort of series of sh uh, sh shifting uh, priorities. <laughs> But hopefully uh, alcohol remains on the menu. Um, what, we're, what we're gonna do is, is, is run very, very quickly down to Lincoln Center to have a drink, just to enjoy the, uh, each other's company. I, I would like to say that this, um, what, what was said at the very beginning of the day and what was said at the end somehow linked together. The expansion of universities, let's say within New York City and the global expansion of universities, these are absolutely the same uh, uh, phenomenon at slightly different scales. So what you're seeing is, is if I tell you the story of the School of Architecture, it's very much a story of expansion. Uh, if you hear the story of the university, it's expansion. If you hear about the global story, it's also expansion. In other words, there's an enormous uh, uh, expansion of capacity going on, which, which is a multi-scalar uh, phenomenon. It's extremely uh, uh, interesting. Something similar is happening with museums, something similar is happening with uh, information networks. But I don't, I'm not sure that the question of expansion has really been subjected to academic study. In other words, we really haven't developed enough intelligence about what it means, this process of uh, expansion. So I think there will ultimately be some kind of feedback loop by which universities start to think about their own status. And, and I think there's gonna be a lot more work on the history of the university and therefore the future of the university to come. And it will start with panels like this one. So I'm really, really grateful for Carol for for convening such a panel on such a crucial issue and for the amount of expertise, you simply cannot believe how little life these people on this panel uh, have. <laughs> uh, and, and so, for, the, for their purpose, let's go and have a drink. Thanks.